Book Five, Canto Twelve, The Legend of Artigal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Book Five, The Legend of Artigal, Canto Twelve. Artigal doth Sir Bourbon aid, and blames for changing shield. He with the great Grantorto fights, and slayeth him in field. O sacred hunger of ambitious minds, and impotent desire of men to reign, whom neither dread of God that devils binds, nor laws of men that common wheels contain, nor bands of nature that wild beasts restrain, can keep from outrage, and from doing wrong, where they may hope a kingdom to obtain. No faith so firm, no trust can be so strong, no love so lasting then, that may endure and long. Witness may Bourbon be, whom all the bands which may a knight ashore had surely bound, until the love of lordship and of lands made him become most faithless and unsound. And witness be Gerioneo found, who for like cause fair Belge did oppress, and right and wrong most cruelly confound. And so be now Grantorto, who no less than all the rest burst out to all outrageousness. Gainst whom Sir Artigal, long having since taken in hand the exploit, being thereto appointed by that mighty fairy prince, great Glorianne, that tyrant to fordo, through other great adventures hitherto had it forslacked, but now time drawing nigh to him assigned, her high behest to do, to the seashore he gan his way apply, to wheat if shipping ready he mote there descry. Though when they came to the sea-coast, they found a ship already, as good fortune fell, to put to sea, with whom they did compound, to pass them over, where them list to tell. The wind and weather served them so well, that in one day they with the coast did fall, whereas they ready found them to repel, great hosts of men in order martial, which them forbade to land, and footing did forestall. But neither more would they from land refrain, but when as nigh unto the shore they drew, that foot of man might sound the bottom plain, tell us into the sea did forth assue. Though darts from shore and stones they at him threw, and wading through the waves with steadfast sway, Morga the might of all those troops in view did win the shore, whence he them chased away, and made to fly like doves, whom the eagle doth affray. The wild Sir Artigal, with that old knight, did forth descend, there being none them near and forward marched to a town in sight. By this came tidings to the tyrant's ear, by those which erst did fly away for fear of their arrival, where with troubled sore he all his forces straight to him did rear, and forth issuing with his scouts afore, meant them to have encountered, ere they left the shore. But ere he marched far, he with them met, and fiercely charged them with all his force, but tailors sternly did upon them set, and brushed, and battered them without remorse, that on the ground he left full many a course, nor any able was to him withstand, but he them overthrew, both man and horse, that they lay scattered over all the land, as thick as doth the seed after the sower's hand. Till Artigal, him seeing so to rage, willed him to stay, and sign of truce did make, to which all hearkening did a while assuage their forces' fury, and their terror slake, till he an herald called, and to him spake willing him wend unto the tyrant straight, and tell him that not for such slaughter's sake he thither came, but for to try the right of fair Irenaeus' cause with him in single fight, and willed him for to reclaim with speed his scattered people, ere they all were slain, and time and place convenient to a reed, in which they too the combat might derain, which message when Grant Otto heard, full fain and glad was he the slaughter so to stay and pointed for the combat twixt them twain, the morrow next, nor gave him longer day, so sounded the retreat, and drew his folk away. That night Sir Artigal did cause his tent there to be pitched on the open plain, for he had given straight commandment, that none should dare him once to entertain, which none durst break, though many would right fain, for fair Irena, whom they loved dear, but yet old Sergis did so well him pain, that from close friends that dared not to appear, he all things did purvey, which for them needful were. The morrow next, that was the dismal day, appointed for Arena's death before, so soon as it did to the world display his cheerful face, and light to men restore, 
the heavy maid, to whom none tidings bore of articles arrival, her to free, looked up with eyes full sad and heart full sore, weaning her life's last hour then near to be, since no redemption nigh she did nor hear nor see. Then up she rose and on herself did dight most squalid garments, fit for such a day, and with dull countenance and with doleful sprite she forth was brought in sorrowful dismay for to receive the doom of her decay but coming to the place and finding there sir artegall in battleless array waiting his foe it did her dead heart cheer and new life to her lent in midst of deadly fear like as a tender rose in open plain that with untimely throat nigh withered was and hung the head soon as few drops of rain thereon distill and dew her dainty face gins to look up and with fresh wanted grace dispreads the glory of her leaves gay such was Irena's countenance such her case when article she saw in that array there waiting for the tyrant till it was far day who came at length with proud presumptuous gait into the field as if he fearless were all armed in coat of iron plate of great defence to ward the deadly fear and on his head a steel cap he did wear of colour rusty brown but sure and strong and in his hand an huge pole-axe did bear, whose steel was iron-studded, but not long, with which he wont to fight, to justify his wrong. Of stature huge and hideous he was, like to a giant for his monstrous height, and did in strength most sorts of men surpass, nor ever any found his match in might. Thereto he had great skill in single fight, his face was ugly, and his countenance stern, that could have frayed one with the very sight, and gaped like a gulf when he did gurn, that whether man or monster one could scarce discern. Soon as he did within the lists appear, with dreadful look he Artigal beheld, as if he would have daunted him with fear, and grinning greasily, did against him weld his deadly weapon, which in hand he held. But the elfin swain, that oft had seen like sight, was with his ghastly countenance nothing quelled, but gan him straight to buckle to the fight, and cast his shield about, to be in ready plight. The trumpets sound, and they together go with dreadful terror, and with fell intent, and their huge strokes full dangerously bestow to do most damage, whereas most they meant. But with such force and fury violent, the tyrant thundered his thick blows so fast, that through the iron walls their way they rent, and even to the vital parts they passed, nor aught could them endure, but all they cleft or brast which cruel outrage when his artic did well arise thenceforth with wary heed he shunned his strokes wherever they did fall and way did give unto their graceless speed as when a skilful mariner doth read a storm approaching that doth peril threat he will not bide the danger of such dread but strikes his sails and veereth his main sheet and leads unto it leave the empty air to beat so did the fairy knight himself a beer and stooped off his head from shame to shield no shame to stoop, one's head more high to rear, and much to gain, a little for to yield. So stoutest knights do an often times in field, but still the tyrant sternly at him laid, and did his iron axe so nimbly wield, that many wounds into his flesh it made, and with his burdenous blows him sword it overlaid. Yet, when as fit advantage he did spy, the whilst the cursed felon high did rear his cruel hand, to smite him mortally, under his stroke he to him stepping near, right in the flank him struck with deadly drear, that the gore blood thence gushing grievously, did underneath him like a pond appear, and all his armour did with purple dye. Thereat he brayed loud, and yelled dreadfully. Yet the huge stroke which he before intended kept on his course, as he did it direct, and with such monstrous poise a down descended, that seemed naught could him from death protect, but he had well did ward with wise respect, and twixt him and the blow his shield did cast, which thereon seizing took no great effect, but biting deep therein did stick so fast, that by no means it back again he forth could rust. Long while he tugged and strove to get it out, and all his power applied thereunto, that he therewith the knight drew all about, natheless for all that ever he could do, his axe he could not from his shield undo which article perceiving struck no more but loosing soon his shield did it forego and while he cumbered was therewith so sore he gan at him let drive more fiercely than afore so well he him pursued that at the last he stroke him with the quesseur on the head that with the souse thereof 
Full sore aghast he staggered to and fro in doubtful stead. Again whilst he him saw so ill bested, he did him smite with all his might and main, that falling on his mother earth he fed, whom when he saw prostrated on the plain, he lightly reft his head, to ease him of his pain. Which, when the people round about him saw, they shouted all for joy of his success, glad to be quit from that proud tyrant's awe, which with strong power did them long time oppress, and running all with greedy joyfulness to fair Irena at her feet did fall, and her adored with due humbleness, as their true liege and princess natural, and eke her champion's glory sounded over all who straight her leading with meet majesty unto the palace where their kings did reign, did her therein establish peaceably, and to her kingdom's seat restore again, and all such persons, as did late maintain that, that tyrant's part, with close or open aid, he sorely punished with heavy pain, that in short space, whilst there with her he stayed, not one was left that durst her once have disobeyed. During which time that he did there remain, his study was true justice how to deal, and day and night employed his busy pain how to reform that ragged commonweal, and that same iron man which could reveal all hidden crimes, through all that realm he sent, to search out those that used to rob and steal, or did rebel against lawful government, on whom he did inflict most grievous punishment. But ere he could reform it thoroughly, he through occasion call it was away to fairy court, that of necessity his course of justice he was forced to say and tell us to revoke from the right way, in which he was that realm for to address, but envy's cloud still dimmeth virtue's ray. So having freed Irena from distress, he took his leave of her, there left in heaviness. Though as he back returned from that land, and there arrived again, whence forth he set, he had not passed far upon the strand, when as two old ill-favoured hags he met, by the wayside being together set, two greasly creatures, and, to that their faces most foul and filthy were, their garments yet, being all ragged and tattered, their disgraces, did much the more augment, and made most ugly cases. The one of them, that elder did appear, with her dull eyes did seem to look askew, that her misshape much helped, and her foul hair hung loose and loathsomely. Thereto her hue was wan and lean, that all her teeth arew, and all her bones might through her cheeks be red. Her lips were like raw leather, pale and blue, and as she spake, therewith she slavered, yet spake she seldom, but thought more, the less she said. Her hands were foul and dirty, never washed in all her life, with long nails overwrought, like puttock's claws, with the one of which she scratched her cursed head, although it itched naught, the other held a snake with venom fraught, on which she fed, and gnawed hungrily, as if that long she had not eaten aught, that round about her jaws one might descry, the bloody gore and poison dripping loathsomely. Her name was Envy, no one well thereby whose nature is to grieve and grudge at all, that ever she sees doing praise worthily, whose sight to her is greatest cross, may fall, and vexeth so, that makes her eat her gall, for when she wanteth other thing to eat, she feeds on her own maw unnatural, and of her own foul entrails makes her meat. Meat fit for such a monster's monstrous diet. And if she happed of any good to hear, that had to any happily betide, then would she inly fret, and grieve, and tear her flesh for fellness, which she inward hid. But if she heard of ill, that any did, or harm, that any had, then would she make great cheer, like one unto a banquet bid, and in another's loss great pleasure take, as she had got thereby, and gained a great stake. The other nothing better was than she, agreeing in bad will and cankered kind, but in bad manner they did disagree, for what so envy, good or bad, did find, she did conceal, and murder her own mind, but this, whatever evil she conceived, did spread abroad, and throw in the open wind, yet this in all her words might be perceived, that all she sought was men's good name to have bereaved. For whatsoever good by any said, or doen she heard, she would straightways invent how to deprave, or slanderously upbraid, or to misconstrue of a man's intent, and turn to ill the thing that was well meant. Therefore she used often to resort to common haunts, and companies frequent, to hearken what any one did good report, to blot the same with blame, or rest in wicked sort. And if that any ill she heard of any, she would it eke, and make much worse by telling, and take great joy to publish it to many, 
that every matter worse was for her melling. Her name was Height Detraction, and her dwelling was near to Envy, even her neighbour next, a wicked hag, and Envy self-excelling in mischief. For herself she only vexed, but this same for herself she only vexed, but this same both herself and others eke perplexed. Her face was ugly, and her mouth distort, foaming with poison round about her gills, in which her cursed tongue, full sharp and short, appeared like Apis sting, that closely kills or cruelly does wound, whom so she wills. A distaff in her other hand she had, upon the which she little spins, but spills, and feigns to weave false tales and leasings bad, to throw amongst the good, which others had dispread. These two now had themselves combined in one, and linked together against Sir Artigal, for whom they waited as his mortal phone, how they might make him into mischief fall, for freeing from their snares Irena thrall. Besides unto themselves they gotten had a monster, which the blatant beast men call, a dreadful fiend of gods and men idread, whom they by slights allured, and to their purpose lad. Such were these hags, and so unhandsome dressed, who when they nigh approaching had espied Sir Artigal returned from his late quest, they both arose, and at him loudly cried, as it had been two shepherds' curs had scried a ravenous wolf amongst the scattered flocks. And envy first, as she that first him eyed, towards him runs, and with rude flaring locks about her ears, does beat her breast and forehead knocks. Then from her mouth the gobbet she does take, the which while ere she was so greedily devouring, even that half gnawing snake, and at him throws it most despitefully, the cursed serpent, though she hungrily erst chewed thereon, yet was not all so dead, but that some life remained secretly, and as he passed afore without in dread, bit him behind, that long the mark was to be read. Then the other, coming near, gan him revile and foully rail, with all she could invent, saying, that he had with unmanly guile and foul abusion both his honour blent, and that bright sword, the sword of justice lent, had stained with reproachful cruelty, in guiltless blood of many an innocent. As for Gran Torto, him with treachery and trains having surprised, he foully did to die. Thereto the blatant beast by them set on, at him began aloud to bark and bay, with bitter rage and fell contention, that all the woods and rocks nigh to that way began to quake and tremble with dismay, and all the air rebellowed again, so dreadfully his hundred tongues did bray, and evermore those hags themselves did pain to sharpen him, and their own cursed tongues did strain. And still, amongst most bitter words they spake, most shameful, most unrighteous, most untrue, that they the mildest man alive would make forget his patience, and yield vengeance due to her, that so false slanders at him threw, and more to make them pierce, and wound more deep, she with the sting which in her vile tongue grew did sharpen them, and in fresh poison steep, yet he passed on, and seemed of them to take no keep. But Talus, hearing her so lewdly rail, and speak so ill of him, that well deserved, would her have chastised with his iron flail, if her Sir Artigal had not preserved, and him forbidden, who his haste observed, so much the more at him still did she scold, and stones did cast, yet he for naught would swerve from his right course, but still the way did hold to fairy court, where what him fell shall else be told. End of Canto Twelve Book Five The Legend of Artigal End of Book Five The Legend of Artigal